Hip hop was born in NYC in 1973. 50 years later, it's a global force for culture, civil rights, and music. And we're celebrating hip hop's 50th anniversary with our special edition hip hop library card. Get yours today at any Queens Public Library location while supplies last. For more information, visit queenslibrary.org forward slash hip hop 50 card. Queens Public Library, along with the New York City Department of Education, will provide free lunches for all children under 18 all summer long. Summer meals will be offered Monday through Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. through September 1st. Enrollment is not required and there is no cost. Just drop by. For more information about free summer meals and a list of participating libraries, visit queenslibrary.org. Is your family feeling prepared for back to school season? Come to any QPL location from August 28th through September 1st to get a physical copy of our Back to School Guide for the 2023-2024 school year. Our guide features tips for getting your kids back on a sleep schedule and articles about family communication, college readiness, and other topics related to health, happiness, and success during the upcoming school year. When you pick up your guide, be sure to look for other fun and exciting back-to-school giveaways and events at Queens Public Library this fall. For more information, visit queenslibrary.org. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's Talk with Wash Shu, author of the Pulitzer Prize winning memoir, Stay True. Stay True was listed as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, Time, the Atlantic, Vogue, Vanity Fair, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, NPR, the Boston Globe, Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, The Millions, Bookpage, LitHub, Reader's Digest, <sighs> Vulture, and Goop. The 2023 Pulitzer Prize Committee stated, an elegant and poignant coming of age account that considers intense youthful friendships, but also random violence that can suddenly and permanently alter the presumed logic of our narrative of our personal narratives. The New York Times wrote quietly wrenching to say that this book is about grief or coming of age doesn't quite do it justice, nor is it mainly about being Asian American, even though there are glimmers of that too. This is a memoir that gathers power through accretion. All those moments and gestures that constitute experience, the bits and pieces that coalesce into a life, Shu is a subtle writer, not a showy one. The joy of Stay True sneaks up on you, and the wry jokes are threaded seamlessly throughout. Vulture declared that it is an evolutionary step for Asian American literature. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pank, Huffington Post, Lambda Literary, The Gay and Lesbian Review, and have recently co-adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. My first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Marier Media in 2011 and is currently streaming on Plex, Tubi, and Amazon. My new novel, Performing on Grata, was released in April by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its 10th year at the Queens Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Hua Xu is a staff writer at The New Yorker and a professor of literature at Bard College. Xu serves on the executive board of the Asian Americans Writers Workshop. He was formerly a fellow at the New American Foundation and the Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center at the New York Public Library. He holds a doctorate in American civilization from Harvard. Xu is also the author of A Floating Chinaman, Fantasy and Failure Across the Pacific. He lives in Brooklyn with his family. In addition to the Pulitzer, Shu also won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Memoir, which is where I met him back in March. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Wa. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's our pleasure. 
So you had previously said that Stay True, which really looks at everything from your parents' immigration to the United States from Taiwan, to your years in college at Berkeley, to your profound relationship with Ken, to Ken's murder during a carjacking in 1998, uh, and, and onward to how you learned about yourself through your relationship with Ken. It's been a story you've been wanting to tell your whole life. You have lived these events that occurred 25 plus years ago. When did you know you were ready to start writing? Did the distance help you approach that really difficult subject of losing a, a dear friend? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I also just wanted to look really quickly shout out Eve, Daniel, everyone at the Queens Public Library, yes. the entire galaxy of Queens. It's really awesome to be here. Um, Thank you. I, you know, it's funny you described it as a story I wanted to tell. I didn't know that it was a story. You know, I knew mm. that there were these moments from my 20s, my late teens, I really kind of remained haunting to me. Um, as you as you explained, like uh, the book is sort of about one of my close friends who was uh, rather senselessly killed when I was in college. And it had this effect on me. Like I think all loss sort of affects people in ways that they have a difficult time putting a finger on or, or finding language for. And so for quite a while, I was just searching for language. I was searching for ways to uh, recapture some of those sensations, some of the scenes, some of those moments, some of the jokes. I didn't know it was a story and I couldn't think of it as one, which is why for about 20 years, I would write scraps of dialogue or, or just sort of try and remember what certain rooms look like. Uh, there was no narrative there, you, you know, because it's hard, it was hard for me at least. And I think it's hard for a lot of people to understand their lives in terms of narrative, oh, yes. especially, uh, in, in the shadow of such rupture. Uh, I think it, it did take a long time for me to understand that there was kind of life, these experiences, these friendships, these relationships, and then there was a story that I could tell about life, these experiences, these friendships, these relationships, and that they were both true and authentic, but they were two different things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, I had been writing things that ended up in the book, you know, since 1990, since the day after this happened, like I, I turned to my journal as this kind of form of therapy, form of coping, but it didn't really take shape as something that could kind of explain anything more than me to myself. Hmm. Uh, that, that happened much more recently. And, and I think it did, it did require a great deal of distance or just, uh, growing older, you know. Um, did you ever consider, because of the sensitive nature of it, I, and, and you're not a fiction writer per se, but did you ever think about writing fiction or writing this as auto fiction? So you'll have to, I've never quite grasped what auto fiction is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the idea that you present something as as a novel, as fiction, but yeah. it's it's like 80% rooted in reality. So it's it's very much like a, almost like a Romana clef. It's, it's, it's the author's life and experiences and relationships, but, but disguised. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess I've always thought most memoir and autobiography is, it is autofiction, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's no way that things happened. Uh, I mean, it's, just, there, it's a narrative, right? It's a story sure. you're telling. Right, uh, right. Whereas life is just random and messy and like contingent, like in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I didn't, I never thought of it that way though, at the time, like I was really trying to just capture these sensations and emotions and feelings. Uh, I have no capacity to write fiction. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think that's why I enjoy being a journalist. Mm -hmm. I'll interview someone, I'll read a book. That constraint is great. Like, mm -hmm. I, I like the idea of trying to find something interesting about someone or, or find some, some through line in someone else's life, right? Hmm. Uh, you interview someone who's an artist, you know, it's this great excuse to ask the person all of these questions about who they were as a child, who they were as a teenager, like how are there, were there moments that anticipated who you are today? Uh, perhaps they didn't think of it that way, but I love that challenge. It's much harder for me to invent those kinds of narratives or forms of drama, like out of thin air. Mm -hmm. There was this, version of the book where I thought like, oh, it would be really interesting if I did put a short story in here 
or or ended with fiction because the book is very much this kind of yearning to return to something that is past uh which i think is you know i think is a common feeling to a lot of people who are sure looking back on things um and i thought like it would be interesting to write like a piece of fiction that speculated as to what our lives would be like had this not happened you know like who would ken be a 45 year old who would i be like and it would just be this incredibly mundane short piece of fiction because you know we had just went on living and sure sure all boring late people i never even started it but it did occur to me i guess it, like it was useful for me to think about that you know because i think thinking about fiction allowed me to think about a different future which is sort of the, the, the place where it's trapped the part of that. interesting i i think over your audio went out a little bit while well, can you say something again can you hear me there we go perfect okay sorry. um yeah no that, that idea it was really um, good whatever i just said so. <laughs> no no i got all of it it was just starting to get muffled <laughs> Um, I, yeah, that idea, I, th I think that the lines between fiction and memoir are starting to collapse more and more. And, you know, in, in certain countries, they don't even have those sort of categories. It's all just literature. Um, and also the point you made about being able to pick other people's brains and, and understanding their life. It's what I love most about doing these sort of interviews. Uh, so I completely get it and can relate. I have to ask you a question that may be a little bit cliche, but um, did writing stay true serve as a kind of a catharsis at all for you? I think I wanted it to be cathartic, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, I'm I'm the type of person I would imagine a lot of. I, I imagine there are quite a few people watching this, given that this is like the library, and 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 we're all people who want to surround ourselves with the ideas and expressions and like art of others. Like I am definitely the type of person who loved before and after this experience, like going to the record store at night and trying to find a piece of music that could tell me how I was feeling, you know, that, that could articulate something back to me. That's why I turned to certain kinds of films or certain types of books, because I wanted that release of someone kind of identifying something that I could um, kind of live inside of or, or be inside of. Uh, as for the book's effect on me, I wouldn't say it was actually very cathartic because, but, but it, it allowed me to move forward in a way that I didn't, I had never really considered. If that makes sense. Like it, it sort of allowed me to reconcile uh, these different feelings at once, which is not a space that I had previously been searching for. Hmm. Uh, I mean, this happened between my junior and senior year. Uh, it's sort of like the first terrible thing that happened to, that was proximate to a lot of the lives of my friends and I. We were just yeah. college students, right? Yeah, you were also young. Yeah, and and so I think for a while I was just so obsessed with how terrible everything was hmm. that it made it harder to kind of recall the joy of, of friendship, right? Or the joy of everything that led up to that moment. If that make, does that make sense? It does. Like it somehow felt like it was diminishing the grief to think about how great things had been just before in our friendships, you know? I, I'm also really interested in time because this happened such a long time ago, right? I mean, yeah. the, the event was July, 1998. And then you write about the years before that, certainly in, in the years just soon after. How does, I'm always fascinated by how memory works. How did it work for you in terms of recalling these things that happened two and a half decades ago? I was pretty obsessive about writing stuff down at the mm -hmm. time. Like I was definitely uh, like into writing my journal. Uh, I was making zines. Right. I, was, I was into archiving my life as mm -hmm. it was happening. The way I think a lot of people who, um, you know, or just interested in culture and art. Like, you know, I, I, I was just a collector, I was a hoarder, and that include kind of the details and, and jokes of, of my own kind of friend group and whatnot. And so after it happened, I just started writing everything down. Some of it were, some of it would be like letters. 
some of it would be you know letters to other people who are still around some of it was just lists of things we used to do or talk about some of it was just like this is this joke means this you know like this is why this joke is funny um and so and, and i kept doing that for the for about 20 years mm. you know i would go back to that journal every now and then just kind of try and remember things and write them down when it came time to actually write what became like the book i tried to just use my own memory mm -hmm. and not rely on the memories of uh of other people or even even memories i had written down years ago like i would look at it sometimes but because so much of the book was about kind of how memory can can ossify you know like yeah. there are times when i would think wow like we used to do this thing all the time and then you do you sort of look at a calendar and you think like well like we were only in this class for like six weeks like how many times could we have like gone to this one <laughs> you know but right. like having gone to it twice and then having replayed it in your mind of like over and over afterwards like it becomes this core memory right and so yes. i kind of wanted to disentangle that or at least complicate what it was i was holding on to you know and so there are moments of the book that i just tried to write from from memory and through the fog of memory rather than uh fact checked you know I, rather than I, like talk like sort of convening all my friends be like that that one month when this when like we were doing this like what do you remember about that because that really wasn't what the book was about it was about me just kind of being fixated on my own memories and then realizing that some of them were probably not useful memories to hold on to or, or even like maybe even accurate well in addition to the honesty what also makes the book so great is how close you were able to get us to your experience of certain things that I think so many of us can relate to at a certain period in our time, you know, like late teens, early 20s, mid 20s. Um, there's a real closeness to the activities and to the relationships and to the dialogue. And you paint such a vivid uh, picture of Ken that the reader starts to feel like they know him. Uh, and, and it becomes really painful when, when we learn what had happened to him. Before all of that, even, um, you recall uh, your parents uh, emigrating from Taiwan, your dad in the 60s, your mom in the 70s. They both earned graduate degrees. They met in Chicago. Uh, they had you, and then they moved to Silicon Valley in the 80s. Um, you write a bit about Taiwan from the 1800s to the 1960s. Tell us a little bit about that research, not just into the history of Taiwan, but also into your parents' history. What was that process like for you? Uh, it was great because uh, I, you know, like I was saying before, I always wanted an excuse to just pester my parents with these <laughs> questions. I mean, it's pretty cliche, right? Like there's a huge part of your life. I, mean, I don't want to generalize. There's a huge part of my life when my parents would tell me things about growing up in Taiwan, coming to the United States, uh, their own viewpoints on things that I found wholly uninteresting because mm -hmm. I was a kid, I was a teenager. Sure. As a kid, you're only responsible for your own whims you know, and your own passion. So yeah. I was, my questions were like, if you were here in, you know, 1974, why didn't you buy this comic book? Why didn't you buy these <laughs> baseball cards, which I would now like, which I now covet, you know, like, right. why didn't you go see this movie? If everyone else, you know, like I wasn't that interested in their lives because I was too busy trying to like figure my own life out. Sure. And it wasn't until I was much older, you know, like go, going to college, you, you sort of begin to understand these broader contexts. And so, you know, I really loved that part of it uh, and that some of that was drawn from other pieces I'd written in the past about my parents, uh, those portions of the book. Uh, and I, I love that opportunity to just kind of sit with them and, and try and try and understand them, but also get them to understand that their story is part of the American story, right? That their part, their, their story is actually part of history writ large. Mm -hmm. and that there's a significance to people like me, maybe someone picking up a book, understanding the experiences of them and their generation. That's not something that I think they innately understood or sought as just these immigrants to the United States. Like they didn't necessarily understand their stories as part of American history. So that was kind of a cool part of it to realize mm -hmm. that, you know, th they're, 
they're that they, they they might recognize they might be able to recognize that because hmm. it was a nice gift for them too i mean i'm sure what, what did they think about when, <laughs> i don't know they, 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 read, they, they read the book right and so what did they think particularly about those sections i think that they uh i don't i, I mean i it would be like a gift seems uh <laughs> it, it, it wasn't a maybe gift. A, it was like, a tribute a gift, on some level, maybe. <laughs> a gift to me that I was able to, uh, yeah. um, that they gave me material to write about. Like uh, now, whenever my, I like had an argument with my father and he joked, like, now you'll have to write another book about me, <laughs> how I really am. Um, That's funny. You know, I think that they, they sort of appreciate how, they appreciate why I found their, their path so interesting, hmm. you know, and, I think that there's so many ways in which we're different, but the fact that we can sort of come together on the page is like very meaningful. And I mean, I'm very close to my parents, but I don't think they've ever quite understood why they feature at all in the writing I do, you know, because mm -hmm. it seems, but that's sort of the point. The point is to say, I'm quoting like Aristotle and Derrida and like, all these other people i'm also quoting like my parents i'm also quoting my friends and that that um that we should all regard the people we we treasure around us that way you know and so i, I as you're as you're I, i'm listening to you and as you're saying that i'm also just trying to find the page that you're marked because i wanted to read a quote in a, a little while uh the aristotle quote that you just alluded to but i want to talk a little more about ken um you're really candid about how when you first met him in college you didn't necessarily like him because he represented a type of person that you sort of railed against which is to say mainstream straight laced how and when did you eventually begin to become his friend and realize that on some level he was actually a very original philosophical deep thinker that the kind of thinker that you fancied yourself to be <laughs> or wanted to be on some level I was I was fascinated and impressed by how frankly you explored this. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I I don't really know when I I I don't know when my opinion changed because again, I think when you're, you know, when you're at that age, like 19 or 20, you don't really have you're either you, you there's the intensity of your emotions so much greater than the intensity of like my middle age emotions. Right. So you just don't necessarily, I wasn't reflective in that way. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. it, it was like a delight to realize that this person who I had, had, had like just categorically dismissed was actually a pretty <laughs> fun person to hang out with, yeah. but there wasn't really that, I, there wasn't really that, epiphany of oh you know what like it's really interesting that i thought this and now i think this hmm. because you're just sort of within that flow you know right. you're within that you're living inside that transition and it really wasn't into and, and and we obviously recognize that like i recognize that he recognized that but its significance didn't it, it wasn't it wasn't significant actually until after he was no longer there to like continue growing with us you, you know what i mean like it wasn't the kind of thing where you uh yeah i mean it, i think like when you experience loss of any sort and you realize that this this person's narrative is over mm -hmm. to some extent it becomes a narrative like it becomes something more discreet than just that kind of erratic flow of everyday life, you know, where one day someone's your best friend, the next day they're not, you know, and then, and that doesn't, there's no narrative there. It's just sort of like, that's just how, how day-to-day -day things work in college. Right. And yeah. you don't really understand it until you step back. And that moment was a moment where we all had to step back and then think about like, wow, this is, it's crazy how impactful this person was in mm. this way. Um, but yeah, like I, when I first met him, I was, I write about in the book, how I really fancied myself like a little aesthete, like, uh, <laughs> like, like I was very into, um, the thing that I, yeah, yeah. I, was just, I was just super <laughs> into being into things, you know? Right. So yeah. if you were into, uh, like, I remember there, like, there's a guy who's like super into like new metal, you know, which mm -hmm. was not very popular at the time. And I thought like, I don't like that kind of music, but the fact that you're so into something, 
uh, you're, that you're also into something that no one else in our dorm likes. Like, I like that, you know? Right. Sure. And so I was just seeking out people who were into like subcultures, like alternative stuff. And at first he just did not at all strike me as someone like that. And, you know, very quickly, you know, when you're in college, you're, you're just sort of living with people for the first time. And so it, it took a few months, but eventually I realized like he was just as original and as yeah. um, much of a uh, conspiratorialist, <laughs> you know, like a sarcastic, uh, but he, he shared all the same qualities I did. He just wore right. much more um, like fashionable clothes than I did. You know. Right. And I think, you know, Mary Gaskell is one of my favorite writers. And she always says that when she creates a character, she creates them as though you're meeting them at a party for the first time where you make snap judgments and you generalize them. And then when you get to spend some time with them throughout the course of the party, you realize they're a lot more deeper and complex and interesting yeah. than you gave them credit for when you first saw them. Yeah. Um, I'd like to read that quote from Aristotle that I alluded to a second ago that's in your book. Um, the lives of the young, Aristotle observed, are guided by emotion and they pursue most intensely what they find pleasant and what the moment brings. As they advance in years, different things come to be pleasant for them. Hence, they become friends quickly and just as quickly cease to be friends. For as another thing becomes pleasant, the friendship too changes and the pleasure of a young man changes quickly. Um, Talk to us about why you included that quote and, and particularly in context um, of your friendship with Ken. You know, I, I'm sure Aristotle was talking about something far, <laughs> like much, like very different from what it's like to, what it was like to live in the 1990s. You know, like I'm sure it was sure. more like, a, uh, you know, like a butterfly delights someone <laughs> and they run off. And, they, and then that is a sort of like level of passion. But, but I, I think um, what really struck me, what why that quote, felt so modern was this idea that um we're all just placeholders you know mm. that it's it's sort of the term people give each other their first year of college like uh that these that the friends around you are just placeholders until you find the friends that you're meant to find like mm. your actual tribe and yeah that aristotle quote when i read it and i don't i can't quite recall where where i read it uh it really struck me as yeah like the the whims of youth are so extreme you you're you're just so convinced that you're feeling things that you'll never feel things as intensely as you are feeling at that moment and yes. perhaps that's true mm -hmm. and that that can affect and and that, that sort of but that affects other people you know and the fact that you're so passionately into this might push this person away but like that's fine because like i am running towards this passion and it's all in the pursuit of pleasure or meaning or things that, you know, as you grow older, you, you are able to find in more um, in ways that may be more generous towards other people. But, you know, mm -hmm. at the time, uh, I think I, it, it sort of helped me understand myself as a teenager, as, as someone in my 20s. Like I, I was always the person who would sort of leave myself that escape hatch if the adventure I thought I deserved presented itself, you know, like I, I like my friends. They were just like so patient with me. They're, they're very good people. I'm still friends with, I would say like 85% of the people in the book, but I was also like, man, but like if, if those people who are into like the same music I'm into invite me to like go to a show, like, Oh, I'm going, I'm doing that in an instant. You know? <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so I I, th I just thought that, that quote captured something like that for me, and I think that that's a very relatable feel too. You know, like you're you're incredibly loyal at that age, but you're also, uh, you know, you could also be very disloyal, a little right? flighty, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I was true. I was a very uh, I was a very non-committal. I, I would say into my thirties, into my late thirties, I was a very non-committal person. I would. Just, I feel like. That's something that's universal and timeless, but also I think you did a really good job of capturing um, the psyche of Generation X in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> we're exactly the same age. I related yeah. to so much of what you were saying, the references you were making, and, and the mindset you captured. Um, wow, would you mind reading a passage from Stay True for us? Sure. Um, so, OK, good. So this this actually, I don't really need to explain that much. Um, this is about like halfway through the book. Um, and it's sort of a moment, I would say, you know, earlier I was saying that there weren't that many opportunities to be really reflective about 
aspect of life as it was changing. But I feel like, and it's a little cliche, but like the end of a semester was always a time to kind of look back on, you know, how you change or sort of like the things you learn. So this, this is a kind of, I guess the winter of maybe like second year of college. Uh, my friends and I are, are trying to like figure out some things to do together. Friendship rests on the presumption of reciprocity of drifting in and out of one another's lives with occasional moments of wild intensity. When you're 19 or 20, your life is governed by debts and favors, promises to pick up the check or drive next time around. We built our lives into a set of mutual agreements, a string of small gifts lobbed back and forth. Life happened within that delay. I started a secret Santa exchange, only I was anti-religion and I didn't want to call it that. So it became known as the secret non-denominational winter holiday gift giver. I thought college was where I would find my people, which I assumed meant people who dressed like me, listened to the same music as me, wanted to see the same movies as me, variations on the theme of me. But I realized maybe too late that all I wanted was friends to listen to music with, someone curious enough to ask what something was and then reciprocate by playing me something by Styx or Christopher Cross or another artist I was far too cool to know. Hmm. Everybody likes something, a song, a movie, a TV show, so you choose not to. This is how you carve out space for yourself. But the right person persuades you to try it and you feel as though you've, met, you've made two discoveries. One is that this thing isn't so bad and the other is a new confidant. Ken told me how he had driven all over San Diego in search of the CD single for Pearl Jam's Jeremy because of a song called Yellow Lead Better. I rolled my eyes as aggressively as possible. Clearly a ripoff of a Jimi Hendrix song. I dug through my record trying to find Little Wing, but Ken was elsewhere, following the song's fluttering guitar line, remembering a girl for whom he'd played it. Eventually we struck a compromise. Before our finals, we would sit in front of my stereo and reverently listen to Yellow Lead Better. It wasn't so bad. Then my choice, David Bowie and Queens Under Pressure, would rouse us out the door. We lived for rituals, looking forward to the day when they would be so instinctive that we would forget how they started. There was still time to repay these gifts. Thanks. Really, really fantastic. So, you know, you really capture a lot in those uh, in those pages. And thank you for reading. Tell us what it was like being a student at Berkeley in the mid to late 90s and its <laughs> reputation for being so progressive and even radical. Uh, I think that I think that uh, there are there are exceptions, of course, like I would say like COVID was an exception, 9-11 uh, was an exception. But I think that most college experiences are actually quite cliche mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of inhabiting that cliche in in your own particular context yeah that's Does that make great. sense like yeah I love that. it's not necessarily and that's not that's not meant to be like a sad realization it's actually mm -hmm. kind of cool to realize yeah. that uh people before you have been in these positions and had the same dreams and thought the same things and it's your imperative to think that you know more than they do, you know, and maybe you do, hopefully you do. Sure. Uh, Berkeley is a place where this is particularly acute. It's kind of like, it's kind of like moving to New York actually, you know, where <laughs> like I've lived in New York for, I don't know, like somewhere between like 12 and 20 years, depending on uh, if you count, like when I start paying city taxes, but <laughs> like, I don't identify as a New Yorker because I have too much respect for like what New York is. <laughs> like mm -hmm. people who actually grew up here, like Berkeley is the type of place where you go and you feel like all of a sudden you have to be part of this tradition of like protest and political debate. Um, and it's like incredibly invigorating. Like I, I absolutely loved it. It was, it's really a place that I look back upon very fondly. I went to college, I started in 1995. And so mm -hmm you know, the free speech movement, the civil rights movement, black power, yellow power, American Indian movement, like all of these things that had happened just on this campus, right? Or within like a three or four mile radius. Uh, all of these things were still in the air. Like those people were now our professors. They were our TAs. They were the ones uh, selling old ephemera at flea markets. They were the people running the bookstores. So 
it was really hard to escape the shadow of the 60s, you know? Sure. And, you know, for someone like me, like, I absolutely loved it. Like, I would uh, go and interview, I mean, like, I in interned at the Black Panthers newspaper when, when a couple of them were trying to get it back going in, like, late, mid-90s. Like, I, I loved, I would always go to office hours and just sort of, like, pester my my professors with questions about, like, what they had been like when they were my age on this campus in like 1968. So it was a really exciting time. Um, but I feel like it's always an exciting time, you know, and it, and it's always dispiriting to know that you're not doing the exact same things as the generations before that are so sure. you know, idealized, but, um, yeah. So it's, I, it's like, it was incredibly cliche in other words. Yeah, but I, I love I, that I, idea though of like it being a cliche, but yet, you you create your own nuance and, and originality within that that cliche, you know, that yeah, every generation yeah. has that. You write so much also about identity, obviously identity formation and how you and Ken felt unseen and unrepresented as Asian Americans in the media. You discuss Charles Taylor and his notion of staying true to yourself. Um, again, nodding, you know, to your book's title. I know there are several layers there. And you you became a, a mentor to high school students who were considered at risk. Please talk a little bit about some of that, uh, some of those experience and experiences in that period. Yeah, I, I think again, it was this thing where when you're when you're when you're just living and when you're not, you know, I was. I think like now as a writer, I might think about things in in within a narrative structure, but mm -hmm. you know, when you're just kind of going about your business, um, you know, before. Ken's passing, trying to find your path as a student afterwards, trying to like reconcile something. I didn't necessarily understand how interrelated all of these things were, you know, like, yeah, like he and I would talk about, I guess what we today call like representation all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we would talk about like, why, why on TV is like, do you not see this? Like what's up with the real world, all these things. On the other hand, I was mentoring um, Southeast Asian youth who, like, according to, um, you know, most categories, like, we're all Asian American, but with whom I shared very little in common, you know. Mm. And when I look back on it, I feel like a lot of the things I was doing were, these were all things that were in conversation with them. Like, I was interested in identity. I didn't process it that way, though. You know, I was just sort of like looking for new experiences, looking for new um, challenges, looking for new ways to um, kind of stress test ideas that I was mm -hmm. that, that I had for myself. Um, but yeah, it's something I still think about a lot now because I'm, I'm a college professor and I'm around young people all the time. And so right. I was going to ask you about that, too. Like, yeah. What is it like to now be on the other end of it as a professor? <laughs> It's really beautiful uh, in the sense that, you know, like what I was saying before, it's always a little cliche, but mm -hmm. your responsibility is to like, you know, break the cliche or, or sure. to, to like live it in a different way. Yes. But um, I, I try to be pretty hands off in that regard. Like I don't necessarily, uh, I, I think that young people have it hard enough. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't really need someone telling them like, well, in my day, like, X, Y, and Z. And so, sure. for, for, you know, like with this book, for example, it was important for me to write about the time in a way where, you know, you and I are the same age, like you understand a lot of what I'm talking about. But I didn't want someone younger to read it and think like, oh, this guy is just romanticizing dial-up modems. You know, like, <laughs> like I, I look back on that era fondly. Right. right? I look back on like cassettes and all that. But like, the point of it isn't to say like we had it better or this is a better experience. The point in a way is to say like, you're having experiences like this too. You just don't know it yet. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I thought you did do that very successfully. It didn't feel like you were trying to like embalm a certain era. You were trying to make it relative to what people of that age that we were back then are experiencing now in this new context. Yeah. So I always try and let my students just kind of, you know, they're into different things, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I just try and guide them in, a, in as hands-off a way as possible. 
Another thing that I found interesting was, you know, you write a lot about how you thought and felt before Ken's passing and then after. You write so much about music, and I know music was so important to, to you and to Ken. Um, you wrote about how harmony changed for you after Ken's death and how you can no longer listen to anything from before. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit um, about this? Yeah, you know, there's this, um, there's this great poet, Nathaniel Mackey, um, and I profiled him a few years ago, and he's he's writes a lot of it. He like writes through jazz a lot, and mm -hmm. so and he had this phrase that I think I've copied. Uh, but we were listening to something together that he had been listening for fifty years, and he said something like, "When I listen to it, I hear all my previous listenings." Mm. Oh, you know? that's interesting. Yeah. And I think that that's why that's why music hits us the way it does because, you know, I'm, like you know. Oh, like X is a great song, but what you're really reacting to is your memory of hearing it for the first time, your memory yes. of hearing it in a car, your memory of hearing it like that one time. Yes. Um, and so it's sort of like a uh, cumulative effect of a song is that that awareness that you've heard the song thousands of times with right. with different people. You know that, that that's why certain songs are so painful to listen to. Oh yeah. If yeah. they remind you of an ex or something like that. Sure. Um, and so I think for me, because I had been so kind of intensely into music and like, I don't think I was more into music than, you know, like it, it wasn't like that unusual, but like, I, you know, that was like my thing. Like I was into me. I was the guy who like went to the record store every week, bought all the newest singles, like wrote about them in my zine. Um, and there was just sort of this, emotional attitude that the music I, I loved had that no longer fit how mm -hmm. I was feeling, you know? And that is, and, and I think like harmony or things that just sounded like perfect, mm -hmm. you know, like the idea of like the perfect pop song, songs that are just so uh, melodic, the harmonies are so perfect. The voices are just sort of like interweaving, like you imagine like a chorus of angels. Like that was just music that no longer, I, I didn't want to hear anything like that. Anymore. Sure. I didn't, I didn't want to hear music that had like dissonance because I felt more dissonant than the music felt, you know? Wow. And so I think I just saw like, I just kind of got into different kinds of music. Uh, maybe that would have just n happened naturally, but there was something about the emotion, the, the emotionally, like listening to a bunch of music that you have memories associated with and then going to music that you have like no associations with. That was something that I think I was seeking out and, and that there were also these like aesthetic reasons for it. I, I get that completely. I'm in the same way also with, with certain films, honestly. Um, yeah. Your publisher had sent us a few photos that were uh, featured in your book. Can we just take a look at those and maybe you can narrate them briefly as we go through sure. them? Um, okay. Um, yeah, so the book has these different um, images throughout. They're not necessarily meant to be, uh, I don't know. It's because there's no actual chapter divisions. So they're right. just like random images. There's, there's no chapter numbers or chapter titles. Uh, this is just a picture of uh, us uh, in my sophomore year apartment on Dwight Way eating chips. So you guys are maybe like 19. 18, 19. Uh, yeah, I would say he was very young, so I would say eighteen, nineteen. And then in the back, this is really Sorry. this is really unnecessary uh, trivia, but <laughs> in the back is a bedspread that we took to uh, the Tibetan Freedom Concert. Hey, okay. Which was uh, a sort of like concert that the Beastie Boys threw. Yeah, yeah. And we just brought I just brought some sharpies and like and just kind of drew on it. And then for whatever reason, we hung it up behind That's that. great. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, those are just, that's my first year dorm. Uh, that's my friend Anthony to the right, who took the photo who's on, that's on the cover of the book. And Ken's drinking out of my book. This mug. year? So yeah. this one? Okay. And is this, who is, is this? That's Ken. Ken? Okay. Then are these friends or are these just random people that are? Uh, that's, uh, I think that's, Derek, behind him is this guy, Irami, who I, who, um, I talk about in the book. 
then to the right is my friend Dave, who is like my roommate. My and then we have someone in the foreground here to the left. Oh, yeah, that's uh, I think that's Derek. Oh, that's Derek. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. How about this? One? Uh, that's also my apartment sophomore year. Uh, in the back is this giant dry erase board that my friend and I made, uh, <laughs> my friend Sammy. Uh, that, uh, yeah, it was like we just bought giant erase boards the size of uh, like a mattress <laughs> and then used uh, duct tape to, it, it was like, it's you know, impressive. It was like the height of like uh, it, it, I thought it was really incredibly enterprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's from the same day as the cover image. Ah, and that's, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. And Where was this and again? This was the roof of uh, Ida Sproul Hall, Unit okay. Three, Berkeley. Okay. And uh, Ken is taking a photo of our friend Irami. Okay. This is a. Uh, like an Asian American newspaper that my friend and I, that, that a bunch of us, no one in the book actually, um, edited. Okay. And yeah, I mean, Berkeley was so big and there's enough Asian American people there as students that I think there were like multiple Asian American news magazines, but this is the oh, one I worked cool. on. Nice. And then we're up in there. Yeah, this is this where is, uh, this is where uh, Ken lived at the. I mean, this is uh, it's in the book, but it's this is where he lived. Okay, well, great, thank you, thank you all. Um, can we talk a l very briefly about um, you, you write about the arraignment of Ken's uh, killers and you describe them with care? Uh, surprised that people as small as they your age at the time could be capable of such violence. Um, you took an interest in the mundane, the mundane details, the minuscule knowable facts, as you write, of their lives, not to understand their motives, though. You also referenced uh, Edward Callot Carr's What is History? Please say more um, about this need to sift through these small moments of the past to resist the future, as, as you put it in the book, and what it did for you. Yeah, I think I was just very, um, I think I, you know, I, like I said earlier, I was really into just like archiving or, and just kind of holding on to bits of the past. It was just part of my, just part of my personality anyways. Like before this started, Brian, Eve and I were talking about like old comic books and old baseball yes. cards. So yeah, yeah. I, it's it just sort of part of my personality that I, hold on to, you know, like bits and pieces of the past. I, I think that there is a sense, you know, for many years, I wasn't sure what it meant to like move forward. Like I was just very much enamored with this, this past and sort of these questions of what if. Uh, and I think that that was a way of not wanting to I mean, I was moving forward in my own life, like you know, going to school and whatnot. But sure. I think that there is a resistance to, I don't know. I don't know what I was resisting, really. But I know that it was like the notion of the future, because in the future, it's it's much harder to recover that past. Right. And, and mm -hmm. it, it feels as though it's like a, like kind of an abandonment, right, to, to sort of move so far in the future. Yes. that you leave behind this memory um and so i think there was there was a sense that everything i held on to because there are all these like literal things that i kept from our friendship from from the week it happened all that stuff uh that if i just sort of held them in the right way or if i thought about them if i looked at them long enough something would make sense i don't know what that would mean but i think it was just uh and I don't, I don't think it's that unusual, right? Just that, right. Uh, you know, if I, if I hold on to this last pack of cigarettes we were smoking long enough, something will yield itself. You know, so, somehow something will, some resolution will come or some sense of meaning will emerge. Uh, yeah, and so that, that's sort of why I, 
became fascinated, I think, with these mundane details or just sort of these mundane effects. Um, and it wasn't, and, and you know, it, it actually ended up being the result of a book that he had left at my apartment that I had never, that had been like too cool to read, that I read much later. Um, and it was about this relationship between like history, the historian, and sort of dreams of the future. Um, that, and reading that book sort of allowed me to think like, wow, like it, we are sort of all on this continuum, this impossible continuum. And we will never be disconnected. You know, mm -hmm. there's no fear that uh, the future and the past will ever actually be dis disconnected as long as you sort of realize that um, any vision of the past or any vision of the future sort of requires you to understand. Uh, it, it sort of takes into account your feelings and motivations for the present and your feelings towards the past. So that's like a really beautiful idea. Actually, it's really uh, comforting. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, like going back to um, what I was saying before about like being the type of person who would like pick up a record and, and think like, can this sound help me understand how I feel right now? Hmm. You know, like watching the Matrix um, the semester after, you know, he, he was no longer around. Stuff like that just made me think like, wow, like, first of all, I wish we could have talked about that movie because that's sure. totally the kind of thing that we would have been into but you know just that idea of there being this like hallway with all these different rooms and 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 you know that the, that there was that sense of yearning i would feel sometimes when i would see these depictions of uh i remember like feeling that way when i watched inception um mm -hmm. the christopher nolan film just this sure. these these ideas of um how we might reconcile like the past and the future like through the present through an ever-changing present um, it was something that I really sought out in a lot of the things that I would like read or watch or, or listen to. Um, I think that, that, there, that certainly resonates with me. I completely I get that. Um, I've, I've lost people um, and we've had similar relationships and I viewed new experiences through that similar lens. Um, for our viewers, we're going to be taking questions for Wa soon, so please start sending them in. But I still have a few of my own while we wait. So Stature has won, obviously, many awards. It's been extensively written about. Uh, it's appeared on all these top 10 lists. Um, how has it felt to have some, obviously it won the Pulitzer. Um, how has it felt to have something so intimate and personal and traumatic be consumed and discussed so publicly by so many people? <laughs> uh, what has that felt like for you? very weird yeah. Um, yeah i mean it honestly just been really weird because <laughs> it's not something you know we talked at the top of at the beginning of this like about how um it wasn't something i set out to like i was 21 when i started writing things that ended up in the book right mm -hmm. and at that time i wasn't aspiring to become a writer i wasn't mm -hmm. thinking like this will be a book someday. I was just trying to, you know, remember what the great egg fiasco of 1997 sure. was. You know, I was just trying to, you know, get material for my zine, like that I was going to make in his, like, it wasn't necessarily something that I, like, even being a writer was not necessarily part of, part of the, this like vision. So sure. the idea of writing it was always just a very, Kind of selfish project i mean selfish in the sense that like it wasn't going to be work it was just going to be something i did for myself the way you know like uh in order to understand myself more and so when even when i finished it and it was and it was clearly written as a book uh because there was a version of it that i wrote it's like twice as long that's like kind of more my version um even when I finished it and it was a book and, you know, it was going to be published, I thought like, there's no way anyone will ever relate to this because mm. it's so specific to this upbringing, this time, uh, you know, like, you, you know what I mean? Like, so. Yeah, but I think the specificity is what makes it so attractive and universal, actually. Yeah, well, I. I mean, now, now, I, now, obviously, uh, I was wrong, <laughs> but yeah. you know, and and it probably is just the remnants of the the person I was, the character of me as an eighteen year old, mm. thinking like, ah, no one will ever understand me because like I'm into these things that 
nobody gets. Right. But um, yeah, these are all actually incredibly basic things that we experience: um, friendship, loss, sure. jealousy, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So it's so it's been very strange. It's also been just really remarkable to, I don't know, just for people to welcome these characters you know because these are real people but they're right. also now right. characters like right. into their lives or to think about themselves in relation to these characters it's it's just like it's it's just so trippy because <laughs> this is what i do to other people right uh, but i never <laughs> yeah and again like it's naive to think that i the, you know i'm be i was naive to not realize that that's sort of part of the deal but sure um yeah so well, thank you for that answer. We have a bunch of questions and statements coming in. So congratulations on winning the Pulitzer, Mr. Shu. Would you like to comment on the recent rash of public school and library book bans in the USA? Yeah, I mean, there's no, I, there's almost nothing more to say than like, it's just, it's just so, it's just like depressing, messed up. It's, uh, it really just sort of speaks to, I, I mean, it's just, it's evil, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that you would want to, uh, I, as a writer, I'm just fascinated with the imagination mm -hmm. and how we are allowed to, to imagine the things we're allowed to imagine, you know, whether it's like, you know, a singer writing a song or an artist making a painting or someone writing a book, like we're working within the boundaries of our own imagination, like our own sort of perceived horizon. And so, I don't know, to try and actively suppress the horizons that people want to see it just seems so foul and evil and just idiotic like, yeah I, I just don't i don't think <laughs> foul, that, evil and idiotic you really succinctly yeah. captured it. <laughs> it, just, it doesn't seem to be I, I, I don't know just and like the 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 color the kinds of books that are being banned just seems i don't know it just know. it's, absurd, it's, it's yeah it's absurd um so yeah so from April, we have, this is my book of the year. Just happened oh, to find it on Libby. I loved the sample I played. I'm Asian American and had a friend who was murdered in 2020. I really appreciate this book. Thank you for sending that well, in. Well, I'm very I'm sorry. sorry for your loss. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm appreciative that you would sort of, you know, uh, it's always, I'm always appreciative that people turn to these stories as a way of, uh, you know, understanding themselves or to honoring the people that in their lives as well. So thank you. Your book is a beautiful remembrance of your late friend, Ken. What lessons did he teach you about life in a way that nobody else did? Uh, you know, he was very generous uh, and patient. I mean, I had a lot of friends who are generous and patient, but um, I think he was always someone who was kind of extra curious about what made someone tick, mm -hmm. you know, um, he, he was, uh, yeah, I mean, he was just sort of the type of person who would take you and your difference, uh, take you and sort of like your singularity and just try and like understand, understand you on, on your own terms. Mm -hmm. Whereas I was trying to understand everyone on, on my own terms, you know, right, right. and, and that's something, again, like a lot of these things aren't things that I realized in the moment or at the time, there were things that I truly only grasped in their absence later on. Um, and, you know, beyond that, he also played me a lot of songs that I could not stand at the time that I now like, <laughs> really love because sure. they spoke to a kind of optimism that I didn't mm. then embrace, but now I, I sort of like, it's, it's touching. It's nice. Uh, from Anna Christensen, Ken and I were on the high school newspaper together. Wow. Since Yeah, this is incredible. Since writing this book, have you heard other stories about Ken from people who knew him? And how has that added to your narrative of who he was? Thank you, Anna, for sending Yeah, that. thank you. Uh, I have. I've heard a lot. And it's been a real... It's been a real treasure actually to have those experiences uh, mostly because there are aspects of the book where i doubt my own sense of things like I, I think it's sort of innate to the book that i am not like an unreliable narrator but that, that i am a narrator who kind of doubts my own sense of uh 
closeness, proximity, like perception, things like that. And so it's been really cool to just hear from people who we went to school with or who, who grew up with him or uh, like I heard from someone recently who was like his TA in college mm -hmm. and everything just sort of like verify, like every, everyone just sort of confirms one another's memories. You, you know what I mean? Like that there were certain details of, about things that uh, I think feel like so fundamentally core to who he was that everyone who encountered him like shares in that. Mm -hmm. And that's been really special because it sort of is a chance to, um, someone said this to me, uh, but I feel it toward other people as well, is to kind of encounter him again, you know, to meet sure. him again in, these, in those spaces, so. Thank you. Um, from April again, uh, what was the experience like recording your audiobook? The recording was exceptional. Wow, thank you. Um, this is pretty weird. It was also very weird, um, but mostly because, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, because I've never done that before, and it was strange to, I, it's, audiobooks are strange because if the author is reading it and you wrote it, you might want to change things, but you're not allowed to change anything, <laughs> yeah. and so, I think at a very basic level, it's very strange to, you know, lock something in that um, you might have, um, you might feel like, oh, I wish I had another another chance to do that. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was very, it was very emotional, but it was also, um, I don't know, like it, it was also, a, I felt like I was experiencing something that I hadn't written because hmm. I, I had to like listen to myself read it so interesting but yeah it was very strange i i never yeah from emily's song could you tell us the title of the book that ken left behind yeah it was called what is history by um e-h car c-a-r-r what is history by e-h car okay yeah and it's like a i think it's a pretty common book among like his uh or or someone told me that it, one, that it once was a very common book among like people who do graduate work in history, hmm. but it's just a very, you know, kind of breezy book uh, that uh, breezy examination of like what the role of the historian is in uh, historical work. Well, well, this is the most questions we've ever gotten for a guest. So well, I, I, <laughs> I'd like to get through them if that's okay. Would you, is it, is it cool with you to do it sure. more? So from W from MB, what uh, has his what has Ken's family reaction been like to your book? What has his family's reaction been like? Um, well, I talked to his mother actually fairly recently, and I, it was very difficult for her. I mean, it, it's it's sort of never not been difficult for yeah. her, and so I think it was actually you know she's said it was quite difficult to read the book, but that, um, you know, there were aspects of it that where she felt like she was kind of having a new experience with him and that that was like something that was quite beautiful. But um, yeah, I, I can't really get too much into it. Sure. But um, yeah, I, I talk to his mom every now and then. And um, it's, it's nice been thing. one of the really sweet parts of this is just sort of like being able to talk to her and, and reminisce about things with her. Thank you. Uh, from Ray, Ray Juan Wu. Hello, Taiwanese reader here. I learned a lot about Asian American and Taiwanese Americans experiences through your book. Who else's work would you recommend if I want to read more on this topic? Oh, uh, gosh, I don't <laughs> even know where to begin. There's so many people um, to read. <laughs> I'm gonna have to write some some stuff down and get and get back to you. I'm I'm like the type of person where if you ask me what I'm listening to right now, I couldn't even tell you. you remember? Yeah. Yeah. But um, I remember last year, really loving. This is not Taiwanese American, but um, it's sort of quasi Taiwanese American. Was this book by Jean Chen Ho called Fiona and Jane? I really loved. Is a story about these two friends. Um, Nonfiction. Uh, it was a it was a book of uh, it was a book of interlinked stories. 
Oh, so okay. Collection. Yeah. Story I don't know if it's like really about the Taiwanese American experience, but um, yeah, I, I really that was one of the books last year that I really adored. Uh, I'll keep thinking and then okay, maybe back I'll my head. Try your memory. Um, from Charles Chen, one thing you discuss is the difference between Ken's experiences as an Asian American versus yours versus your parents. How do you think your experience now compares to the younger generations? It's a really good question. Um, I'm sure my experience seems so um, useless to younger people in a way because that's just the way things work. You know, right. I, I as think we that, said earlier, right? Yeah, uh, I think that there are probably, I think every generation has their blind spots or their own kind of weird predilections that don't make sense to later generations. But um, yeah, I would say that I think that younger generate like younger people just have access to so much more information mm -hmm. and the pace of like assimilating that information and using it is so different than what it was for me so it sort of allows for these conversations that i never could have imagined having you know like i think that asian americans now seem to have greater grasp of um like the international dimension, the sort of global dimension of race and identity. Um, they're able to like organize much more swiftly uh, mm -hmm. through using the internet as well. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that my experience is just sort of now historical context, the way people in the eighties were historical context for me, so. That's fair. Um, from Liz. You mentioned the importance of music during your interview. Can you name some songs that may enhance the experience of your book? Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, there are some songs that are mentioned in the book a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, the Beach Boys, God Only Knows, uh, Bone yeah. Thugs and Harmonies, uh, Crossroads, yeah. uh, Pearl Jams, Yellow Ledbetter is a song that gets mentioned a few times. Uh, I think those are songs that those are songs Any, that are mentioned in the book. Anything uh, from Nirvana? <laughs> I, There's not, a lot of Nirvana. Yeah, <laughs> not really, because I feel like it's not really music that um, it's. I don't. I don't have like an emotional response to that music necessarily, mm. as as formative as it was for me. Sure. But the those songs are song. These songs are songs that are, are sort of like analyzed, or the, the, these are the kind of songs that I would talk to friends about a lot when I was younger. Okay. Great, thank you. Just finally, um, in the final pages of the memoir, you write about your psychotherapy sessions with a therapist at Harvard, who at first maybe generalized your experiences as a child of immigrant parents, and how you eventually came to realize that she was just trying to understand how you'd become the person you became sitting in front of her that day. You also wrote about yourself and Ken. You, the quote that really stayed with me is, we are not men without a culture. We just have to make it ourselves. And then finally, this term, stay true, comes from the way you and Ken would sign off on letters to each other. Are there any final thoughts regarding any of these ideas or this may be one central idea that you can share as we end? Yeah, I, you know, um, uh, that was a lot that, uh, that you just yes. said. There. Um, <laughs> this idea of staying true though, right? And, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the title of the book was just, mm -hmm. uh, it was a joke. Mm -hmm. And it was just, but then it sort of made sense to use as the title because it was an inside joke, but it's also kind of is vague and it, it can be interpreted in all these different ways. Uh, I think the more, I hadn't thought about any of this at all when I chose the title or when the book is published, but I think I understand the title more now as a result of talking to people who've read the book, you mm. know? Uh, and, and it does feel like it, it makes more sense to me, just this idea that when you're young, like for me, like I thought that there was like this, this me in the distant future on the horizon that I would become, mm -hmm. that there was like this finished article. But in reality, you know, you're just sort of always in the process of becoming, you know, you're always yes. in the process yeah. of changing. Yep. And that is something that is liberating to understand once you understand it. Um, again, like maybe this sounds naive and people just understand this, but I very much thought like, okay, one day I'm gonna just 
be the finished article. Like I will be an adult. I will be <laughs> yeah. a cool person who uh, feels like confident and all these things. But you know, that that's not necessarily how things work. Like you, yeah. you just have to kind of go down the path toward the thing you want to become. Mm -hmm. And along that way, you just sort of have to decide what compromises you'll make, how you'll change, how you'll let people change you. And I think that that's staying true is that is sort of like leaving yourself open to these things while holding on to like your core integrity, you know? I love that. I love that. Um, I lied. We have one more question from Christine, okay, sure. <laughs> from Christine Chang. It just came in. The flow of your writing would translate so beautifully to the big screen. Is there a possibility your memoir would be adapted into a movie? Uh, wow. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's, there are plans, but uh, who knows? <laughs> If and you can't talk about it yet. So yeah, I mean, right now it's, uh, it's a writer strike. Um, right. So even if I wanted to, I couldn't write it. But um, yeah, it's again, it's like strange to me because uh, I I'm drawn to the idea because I want to relive certain moments mm -hmm. of my own life. Does that makes sense. Like, sure. There's things that like my friends who are in the book are like, if you make a movie invite like i need to be there that day when this thing happens because i want to see it again you know yeah, wow um and so that's very that's like a reason i i don't want to do it but um it's yeah but it, if it were to happen it would it would be um years away down the line okay. yeah well the book is stay true by washu it's the 2023 pulitzer prize winner for best memoir well thank you so much for doing this and thank you everyone for watching have a great weekend thanks take care everyone Yes, <laughs> Queen.